a survivor is someone who has been through, um, you know, abuse of situation and they make it out the other side and they give back. Welcome to another edition of the podcast known as Blending the Family. I am your host, Tommy Maloney, and maybe relation, maybe not, don't know, we haven't taken the DNA test. On this episode, Tracy Malone is on the podcast. Tracy has a new book out called Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. I said it. What a wonderful conversation I had with Tracy, and uh, a couple of things. I know this is a lengthy episode, but it is well worth your time. Tracy has some great information. If you are in a relationship with a narcissist, number one, get out. That's just my opinion. Uh, Number two, she has a lot of coaching information. She has a lot of information. But for me, uh, a couple things happened during this episode with Tracy is that as she was talking, I started reliving my past life, my first marriage, and a couple of uh, uh, from uh, the the uh, Minions movie, I had a light bulb moment, and it was it was so exciting for me, for me. Uh, hopefully, Tracy has not charged me for the uh, therapy session. Uh, some of the things we talk about on this episode is well, number one, what is a narcissist? I also ask Tracy because I'm always curious with writers and authors. You know, what is her, what was her writing process for this book? And it was interesting. I'm going to say two words. Post-it note. Oh, that's my wife texting me. Let me just find out uh, what she's saying. Um, do, 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 do. Hold on. There we go. Uh, oh, she'll be home in 30 minutes. Perfect. All right. Anyway, so we talk about what is a narcissist, her writing process, and how to become a Sir Thriver, S-U-R-T-H-R-I-V-E-R. So, and you heard that at the beginning of this episode. So I am uh, thrilled to share with you uh, possibly a relative, Tracy Malone. Her new book, Divorcing Your Narcissist, You Can't Make This Shit Up. Um, Yeah, it it was a lot of fun because... Here's, here's a little backstory, a little peek behind the curtain. I posted something on LinkedIn in one of the Denver LinkedIn groups. And I think it was I was uh, posting out there uh, an episode, podcast coming out a podcast episode. Tracy reached out to me. Next thing you know, we're talking on the phone. Next thing I know, I'm on her podcast, which hasn't that episode hasn't been released yet. And I said... Boy, Tracy, it'd be great to have you on my podcast. She goes, well, I have a new book out. I said, brilliant. So here we are. And it just goes to show that if you take um, like uh, a platform such as LinkedIn, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. Oh, by the way, I'm back on Pinterest. I'm back on Pinterest. So uh, blending family on Pinterest. I'm trying to add content there. So Pinterest, uh, Twitter, uh, also Blending Family, and then the Tommy Maloney on LinkedIn. So if you can take a platform like LinkedIn and you know post something, somebody responds, and then you start cultivating uh, a, a relationship, a, a network type relationship, you never know what's going to happen. That's why I'm not a fan of Facebook uh, because I don't feel that relationships really grow organically. I feel that a lot of it is just, I guess to use a word, a narcissistic um, point of view. I'm probably wrong. I normally am wrong. I'm the dumb guy in the building, dumb guy in the room. So there you go. If if you really enjoy this episode, please leave a rating and review. Um the what what works best for you as far as listening to podcasts i know you can do it on your smart speakers but if you can please leave a rating and review it really really helps let others know about the podcast let them know about blending the family and i'm i'm mentioning this because i got a great great note um from uh speaking of linkedin uh alex sen filippo S A N F L F Alex S A N 
F I L I P P O. Uh, he runs a company called Pod Pros, and he sent me a really nice note uh, on LinkedIn about about the podcast, and it really uh, brightened my day. So that's my point right there. Make relationships, not war. How's that? All right, so please pick up Tracy's new book, Divorce Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. Uh, you can go to one of many websites that Tracy has. Let me, I'm looking through my notes. All my notes. Where did I put the uh, the links? The links will be in the, the notes, in the notes section. But here we go. To get Tracy's book, you can go to the website, uh, divorcingyournarcissistbook.com. Her website is Tracy Malone, T-R-A-C-Y-A-M-A-L-O-N-E.com. Um, also, this is kind of cool. We talk about it towards the end of the episode is uh, her website, TargetedHealingJournals.com. She has several different journals that you can purchase. I am going to be purchasing one about triggers, about triggers. So there we go. Whew. That's a lot. I know I've said way too much, and this the episode is, is a little long, but that's okay. Great information from Tracy. Again, if you're dealing with a narcissist, this episode uh, will really, really help you. And I really do hope that some of the information that Tracy and I talk about will help you in other areas. So um, it's a learning opportunity. There you go. I think I've said everything I need to say. And that's about it. So as uh, our good friend, one day he'll be on the podcast, one day, as Terry Crews would say, your success is my success. Oh, this is throwing me off, Tracy. But that's okay. We we got through technology. We got through the little bump in the road. Um, before, let me move my phone because that's where... I have your information. Before we talk about the book, Divorce Your Narcissist, You Can't Make This Shit Up, um, as, a, as a fellow author, what is and was your writing process for your book? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, my writing process was, um, I, I wrote this book on Post-its, honestly. Um, years and years. Hold on, hold on. The, the, the little sticky colored thingies. Yeah. I mean, I didn't like write it there, but I started with just like, I'd coach people and I go, Oh, that's important. And I'd put it on a post-it and I'd stick it on my table in my dining room. And I would just start adding them together. I just kept building as I saw the need and, and it, I, I went and interviewed um, a whole bunch of people and got thousands of people. We had a, a form on my website and Facebook group that said, what tricks did they pull on you? And so I got like thousands of results and then had to go through those. So I'm finding the answers and the things I want to tell people when I'm coaching pe others and going, oh, that's important. And I'm putting it on the post-it and then I'm <laughs> building, right? So it's just thousands of little notes. And then of course the data, when I started getting all those thousands of things and going, some of these people would submit them and there's no periods and, you know, paragraphs. And, and so you'd just be like reading these crazy long things that happened to them. There's so much trauma in this. And I had to sort through them and kind of, I didn't want all trauma stories because who wants to read that? So it was like, this could happen, but this is how you prevent that from happening. Or if they do this, then you do this, right? Almost using those lessons that people and shared with us, those tricks to help them not only see that this is possible, but see what to do if this happens. So what is, and if you're okay with it, sharing with us, what is your backstory of being a narcissist coach, not, not coaching narcissists, but helping people who are in relationships with uh, narcissists? So what, what was your um, moment going, hey, I want to get into this coaching lineup? 
<laughs> well, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a cognitive choice at the time I was going through and then went through a horrific divorce and didn't know what had happened. No one ever said the word narcissist. No one ever said this isn't normal, but it was called the most tortured divorce in our town's history. And I decided to start my own support group for support of myself and find community and others that talk this lingo. So I started groups here in Colorado and I started with one in Boulder, Colorado. And then all of a sudden it grew and there's hundreds and hundreds of people and we'd have 30 and 40 people in a room. So I started another one down towards Denver and I would get 40 in that group because we had a much bigger room. So the more I saw what other people's thing was, yes, it was validating for me. And I saw that a narcissist could be your neighbor or your boss. I learned that through the groups. But the more I did it, the more I wanted to help people heal and not have it just be a, a, a witching and whining session. Mine did this and so did mine because we don't move on. We don't heal from that. So, you know, I started to study the wounds that people get and started, how do we heal that? And what do they need? And so each month I would bring them a different lesson. And as I grew that way, then I started into the coaching and still had my full-time job for years, but just started helping people. And the more I learned, the more books I read, both on divorcing and you know every aspect of co-parenting or whatever it could be, I wanted to have the answer when people asked me in a coaching session, what do I do now? So that's how it kind of evolved. The book was sort of, you know, again, going, people need, I, I might repeat something 50 times in a week and go, everybody needs to know that. Yes, these people are paying me money for that coaching session, but what if I put it all in a book? And that's where the book came from. I have to ask, uh, have you trademarked uh, Sir Thriver? <laughs> um, I actually am in a trademark battle with someone. I've been using it since 2017, have mugs and t-shirts on my YouTube channel. And then someone did, uh, tra you know, trademarked it in 2021. And I'd been using it since 2017. So um, I had to fight with trademark lawyers, pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and we challenged their mark. So right now it's in debate, but it's considered mine at this point. I'm allowed to, I was told to put the TM on it. Well, good for you. What, but define what is a sur the, sur the survivor? A sur thriver is someone who has been through, um, you know, abuse of situation and they make it out the other side and they give back. Uh, you know, we, we I, I can't even tell you, they don't have to give back and become a, a coach or anything, but they come to, I have people that come to support groups that are long past theirs to come and help others. I've been where you are, let me help you, right? So to me, when I started to see this compassionate person, again, who doesn't need to be coming to a, a support group anymore, but going, but I'm coming because I've been there and I, I wanna help them. That's someone that is a survivor. They've come out the other side and they give back. There's a lot more detail to it, but that's the bottom line of it. Okay, I'm happy that you, you get to still trademark it because I, I think that's brilliant. I mean, um, you know, taking taking a negative and spinning into a positive. Yeah. And again, it gives people something to hope for, you know, not that they all want to go and I help people, but like literally I will be at Starbucks and somehow, I don't know where, but like the guy making me coffee will be like, I have a narcissistic father. You know, <laughs> this year's repairman came over and looked at all my YouTube lighting in my dining room and went, what do you do, ma'am? And I'm like, oh, I support these people. And he's like, oh, my mother's dating one of them and like took all my <laughs> materials, right? They're everywhere. So it's just those little thing of, hey, you know what? I went through that. Here's a really good book you should read. Oh, you're dealing with that. Try this book or this resource. That's still a survivor because you're sharing what you learned so others don't have to go through it. So Divorce Your Narcissist, You Can't Make This Shit Up is, is the new book. What is a definition of a narcissist. And, and from my understanding, looking up the word narcissist, it is relatively 
gender specific. So when I think of a narcissist, I think of a couple of people in, in our recent past, like Donald Trump, Kanye West, just to name a couple, but what is a narcissist? So this is a really important thing that you just sort of mentioned and threw out the, you know, the, almost the flamboyant, the grandiose. We can see it as if they were, you know, flamboyant and it's, they're wearing it on their sleeves. They like to look in the mirror. That sort of is the normal, like, oh, they all only care about themselves. But the sad part is in that explanation, what we're doing is there's different types. They are covert. I mean, sorry, overt where it's, it's clear as the nose on your face, right? The covert narcissist, when everyone only associates the word narcissist with someone that you can kind of see it, you know, they take selfies, everybody, they think they're great. But the dangerous part is the covert narcissist because the covert narcissist is one who everybody loves. They have a very charming persona. They, they are, you know, pillars of the community. They might be the soccer coach. They're the best neighbor. They're going to church. They may be elders in the church. So they have this public persona of being good and honorable. And yet as soon as the door closes after the soccer game, they're screaming at their kid for missing the damn ball and, you know, berate them and attack them. And, and so that covert most victims of narcissistic abuse have that more covert like per person in their life. I didn't know, again, nobody had explained to me the word during my whole divorce, but most people don't, they don't associate this word. They don't even know it's abuse because it's, they're so nice and everybody loves them, right? It makes victims stay longer, but you know, the tactics that they use whether it's in divorce or through the relationship is, is one of manipulation, even that hooking of you with their charm. And, you know, when a narcissist targets you, for example, and says, Oh, they'll be a good, they'll be a good spouse. They'll make a good wife. They'll make a good husband. Right. They're manipulating you with love bombing. They come in so fast and furious and it is like, no one has ever loved you this much. And it, you know, it doesn't have to be material things, but it, it can be, they're buying your love and they're not giving you any time to really see who they are. They start to isolate you from your friends instantly during this stage and your family as well, because they, they are like, but I want to be with you so much. You know, the love and the intensity is like, oh, they care about me so much. Okay. Right. That you don't see that you have just lost your friends. And I want so to take a quick step back because I, I feel that this is where uh, maybe generations are heading towards. And you talked about the world of selfies. Mm -hmm. And in, in my opinion, I, when you watch, especially younger people, and they're constantly, constantly doing selfies, are, has the world of, the, of selfies started to create more and more narcissistic behavior and people? Mm, good question. But no. <laughs> um, so the art and the, the world of selfies, right? That doesn't make someone narcissistic. It makes them have self love. And, you know, maybe they're worried about what they look like on the selfies. So they're more cognitive of how they look and, and, and show the world. But a narcissist has this manipulative side that takes advantage of others for their own gain. And so somebody taking selfies is trying to show the world and, and almost compete. And if you think about our kids, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, who's the popular girls. We had that growing up, but now they're doing selfies and this. So it, you're kind of in this bucket of, you know, entitled people that are sitting there that doesn't make them evil and hurt others. That's the different part. Um, they don't, you know, a narcissist has absolutely no empathy. And while you can say, oh, they oh. have no empathy, oh no, right? But it's not just that they have no empathy. They don't care what they do to you, the victim, or how it affects your family. 
because of that lack of empathy. They will have people arrested. They will call child protective services on the mother of the year um, just to ruin them and get their time, you know, increased and less to the, to the normal parent. They'll make these false allegations. Someone with empathy could never do that. Even if you're divorcing your spouse, you know, you don't want your children to suffer from this. A narcissist doesn't think about the kids. It's revenge. It's you're taking my children. I'll do everything to ruin you. Right. So that's the difference between that sort of you know, selfie kind of it's self-love and it's actually not that unhealthy. Um, it's not on the narcissistic spectrum. Everyone just sort of associates that. Oh, they must be full of themselves, full of yourselves. Yeah, maybe, but not hurtful to others. So is, is the understanding that a narcissist is at a different level versus just having an inflated ego? Yes. Absolutely. Ego is a very small part of it, right? Um, you know, in, in the, the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and this one is really old, it's like from the 2008 or something, but there's, there's five criteria that define narcissism. This book is basically the rule book for a therapist or a psychologist. So grandiose self of importance, right? Exaggerates their achievements, believes they're special, requires excessive admiration and validation, and they're entitled, right? If we look at those five things, which a lot of people are trying to get this changed, it's crazy that they're there because that doesn't really say that they, you know, they're pathological liars. They lie when they don't have to. Um, with that lack of empathy, they have no guilt and no shame. So if you think about someone who has no shame, they're willing to do whatever it is. They don't feel guilty for having the child protective services called on you. Um, they, they intimidate people. They stalk. You know, when we get into the divorce situation, it's not just the lies. It is the lies and the false allegation the, you're a bad parent calling that social services on you. Um, you've stolen money. It, it's just like ridiculous accusations with no care for how you're going to have to defend this or fight this because they've declared it, it must be true. Can you, can you recognize a narcissist or does it really take time and, and conversation? Um, yeah, they don't look any different. <laughs> you know, they don't look any different. Um, they, 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 you know, once someone is aware of the behaviors and the manipulation tactics, um, they can see them in someone if they know to look for them, right? Someone who is irresponsible and, you know, or blames others. So doesn't listen to your boundaries. Those sort of things people can start to spot if they're chronic liars or they are, um, you know, they have no accountability. You're sitting there having an argument with someone in your early relationship and they just did something that was very hurtful and they turn around and blame you. That's not a good sign. That means they can't take up accountability. Someone who talks about integrity, but doesn't act from integrity places. When you start to see those sort of things, then you can pinpoint them. Their behaviors are very much like cookie cutter. Yes, they can vary. Yes, they can be on different levels and um, spectrum. Some will lie. Some will be verbally abusive and scream and call them names and put them down all the time. Mine never did that. My narcissist used passive aggressive types of you know, things to get his way and to make me feel like I was never good enough. Like I could do everything and then do one thing and it'd be like, you're so bad, you know, but it wasn't constant verbal abuse. Some people live under that when they're with a narcissist where it is 24 seven financial abuse in a marriage is another piece where they are, they're isolating you from your family and friends, but they're isolating you from the money. The, the joint family accounts you have no access to, you, you don't know what's in savings, you might have to be the one that, you know, the check comes and you hand it over to them and then they give you a budget, you have $20 for groceries for the week. It's control. It's all about control. Holy cow. I just had a flashback. Uh -oh. I, I, yeah, that was, that was part of my first marriage was 
um, that control that uh, not knowing in this is this is you know where I should have been a better partner as far as asking about you know finances and asking you know the the banking um you know things like that but yeah that oh my gosh that was my world uh, making <laughs> sure that yeah if uh if i had a you know a little bit before you know direct deposit you know the check had to be handed over and yes i did get an allowance mm-hmm. yeah and again some people don't even get that i mean it is it, it again, every single part of this is spectrum, right? Some are going to be controlling about money on the spectrum. My ex husband, like, was so lazy and really couldn't do math. I became the person that did the bills, and that was my responsibility. I'll go to work, you do the bills, and basically wait on me hand and foot and do all the other chores for our family, right? In the end, he starts to tell everybody that I kept him away from his money. And I'm like, wait a second, what are you talking about? (laughs) Like if we would get like a, a a bill from the toll booth and I would be like, it's $2 and 35 cents, but we weren't in town that day. So we should talk to them about this. You know, that's how I was managing and like being careful and cautious. And yet I get turned around and made into this controlling person that wouldn't let him, you know, I'm like, that wasn't my choice. I didn't want to do the bills, but he wouldn't do it. So a spectrum from the controller to, you know, this is how it, that money controlled me. He had me give up, you know, a six figure job to move me across the country and then said, Oh, you don't have to work, honey. And then t- came into court and said, she would never work. I tried to get her to work all the time. And I'm like, I was working 45, 60 hours a week taking care of him. Um, but And that's what he wanted me to do. And then I get blamed for it. So the financial abuse and all of these things go on a spectrum. So anyone who's listening to this, we have to realize that they don't have to yell at you. Um, They could just use passive aggressive silent treatment. You know, nothing makes you feel worse than them just ignoring you or not answering you. It's a passive aggressive type of, you know, a tactic that leaves you very wounded, you know, the silent treatment, the ghosting, you know, just I've had clients with their spouse and they just went away and didn't come back for three months and wouldn't answer them. They didn't even know if they were alive or dead. So spectrum. uh, What other, what other tips or suggestions do you have besides the uh, silent treatment? Um, So there's something called gaslighting. Do you know what that is? You know, I keep hearing it and I haven't Googled it yet. I was busy that day, but please enlighten me and educate me on this new buzzword. Cause I am totally lost with gaslighting. Yeah, no worries. So gaslighting is a, an emotionally abusive tactic that is designed to make the victim think that they're losing their mind. That never happened. I never said that. You're making that, you're putting words in my mouth when you know for a fact they said that yesterday, right? Um, I, I have some gaslighting things that happen in divorce, which keeps people trapped for years. There's no money. If you leave me, you'll get nothing because you never worked. That's not actually true, right? It's a marital estate and everything that there is going to be split the way it would be. But it's that keeping the fear in the victim by saying you'll get nothing, right? Um, Or even another kind of gaslighting tactic in divorce is, you know, falling for the Trojan horse. They're pretending to be nice to settle fairly, but then they're actually hiding the assets. So often in this type of thing, they quit their jobs during divorce, so they can't pay you. They hide money. I've had people with two and three different lives that they didn't even know that their husband had another family. Um, Hold on. Seriously? Oh, God, yes. Oh, God. Oh, that's yes. right. You can't make this shit up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my my last narcissist, which was not my, my divorce, that was before this, my last narcissist, I found out. Not only was he cheating, which I was like, okay, that's it. You're done. Um, but he had been with her for two years of my two and a half. And 
I found out about this woman um, because I found out about another one. I found out he was cheating. I called her door number two. And um, <laughs> it wasn't just door number two. It was the only other single person at Christmas dinner since I'd been divorced. Um, so it was like kind of a friend. I'm like, really? Um, and I, I just couldn't believe that. He kept coming. I broke up with him. He kept coming. And that's called hoovering when they come back. Let me explain why I slept with the only (laughs) other girl at Christmas dinner. And I'm like, no, get away, get away. And then I went there three months later. And actually, it's kind of funny. Yesterday was the day I went there. And I know that because it's on my calendar. The day I went there on a after church and a forgiveness sermon, I went over and stopped at his house and said, okay, I'm ready to forgive you. I don't want you back. But just like our friends think we're weird. So let's just get along. And he called the police and had me arrested. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's how oh, that's right. Can't make this shit up. Yeah. So that's the day. Right. And again, when I was having these support groups with 20 and 40 people, we'd have no less than three to five people that had been arrested by their narcissist. So it's a common tactic, but there I was being, I wasn't being hauled away there. They came to my house later that night to arrest me, but I was in his driveway and there's another girl in his car. And I'm like, wait, I know that face. Like, that's that Facebook girl that's from Australia. What the heck? What is she doing in your driveway? Right. And her and I ended up after my arrest and, and he broke up with her. Now she knew too much. She was a risk. So she called me up and said, what the heck happened there? And we found out she thought he wasn't dating me anymore. And I never thought he was dating her. And so that was three of us all at the same time, one for two years of my two and a half, one for six months of my two and a half, and who else knows how other many. So different lives. And the funny part is when we talk about narcissists, they use people, right? They're users. They they use you for supply. And this guy was in big trouble when I met him. Um, He had taken $10,000 from three people. Think con man here, because that's what we're painting, right? He took that to make websites for them, but never made them. So now they're all suing him. So he dates me. At the time, I was a web designer who makes these sites for free to bail him out. Me, right? The second one, the one from Christmas, well, that girl was a mediator, So now he's using her for mediation services while serving her in another way. And the third one from Australia was a nutritionalist that helped him and his son get back on track and massage him every day. So he was using us for specific reasons and that triple life that he was leading. I said to this girl in Australia, when did you see him? And she was like, well, we actually compared calendars. She stayed with me for three months. And then we went on our bucket list trip to Italy together. But we're looking at this calendar. And every single time she would come to Colorado, I was babysitting his son for a week. So I was the babysitter. And he was off in another hotel down the block and sending me pictures of Chicago where he was pretending to be on a business trip look, I wish you were here. He was just grabbing pictures off of Google images and then saying he was there, but he was really down the street. You can't make that shit up. No. And as I'm standing here pondering this, I'm thinking, well, I hate to say it this way, but that's somewhat of an evil genius, right? Yeah, they are. Yes. It's, it's, it's just, Again, it, it, they, they can be really smart. They can be really dumb. Um, but they also are, when they are in that, that's called a malignant narcissist or even on the sociopath line where they are just so evil that you know it's heartless to do this to three different people at the same time. Um, but I found out he had also arrested his wife three times. So again, no heart no empathy for what that would do to somebody. You, you, you talk about Tracy uh, narcissists being on a, on a spectrum, but are there like types of narcissists? Yeah. So we talked about the overt, which is like the grandiose. We can see it. Um, we talked about the covert, which is the, you know, more silent where people see this person as, you know, the best neighbor, the best soccer coach, all of that stuff. Um, And then there are the malignant, which is really the highest level before you get to psychopathy. Um, It is where there is absolutely no conscience at all. 
Um, some of the other lesser forms of narcissists can have a little bit of a conscious sometimes on a spectrum. Um, but when you get into that malignant, they are the ones who have people arrested. They are the ones who call social services, make false allegations, um, smash their face into a wall when you go to pick up your baby diapers and call the police and have you put in jail for a year for beating them when they smash their own face. That's a, that is a malignant. That is someone who is willing to smash their own face to put someone else in jail, the mother of their child. I would say that's a psychopath. Again, that's the malignancy goes into the psychopathy, you know, the realm. It's it's sociopath, psychopathy. There, It's just, you're in that world. You're just touching it and you're still in the one foot in narcissism because you're not always that way. When you get to be where you're always doing this crazy psychopath stuff, then you go into the more sociopath or psychopath where there's, you know, null and void of, any empathy or anything it's it's those are the murderers you know psychopaths are the murderers i'm now afraid to uh walk the streets <laughs> sorry thank yeah, you tracy yeah. but it, but it's so important because again people if they understand this like i didn't during my divorce i just said why are they doing this why why if they can understand it and understand that they need to get help, you know, going to YouTube university and putting the word narcissist in there is going to yield you millions of results. And some of the, the big YouTubers out there will get a hundred thousand views in three hours. It's, it's that like widespread. And I've coached people as far away as China and Singapore and Germany and all the way back. So it happens everywhere. And so it happens to men um, as well. Again, we're talking mostly I've said, you know, husbands and that sort of thing in this conversation, but the women are terrible. They can be absolutely ruthless and, you know, drag the husband and, you know, try to get the kids taken away from them when, the kids hate the, the uh, you know, the mom in this example, or, or they're abusive to the children and they, they can be so much worse because they've hide behind the mask of I'm the good mother. I would never do anything. And, you know, the kids are crying and horrified by the fact that they're going to lose their dad. So it happens in both realms, men, male and female. But, but statistically it is, more males that are a narcissist, correct? Statistically, um, more women come up to talk about it. Um, if I look at my own Facebook group with 15,000 members, I think we have about a 24% male enrollment and the rest is all the females. So we look at that number, the actual last time, and nobody really understands it, but I quoted it in my book, regardless, the, the, the numbers and the actual, like how many narcissists are there and are they male or are they female is from 2008. And they say one in six people in the United States have NPD. Again, that selfie thing is like, oh, I care about myself, but you don't have the actual personality disorder called NPD. Now that said, no narcissists go to therapy. If they go to therapy, they, again, usually forced by their spouse, I'll, I'll stay with you, but we're going to therapy, kind of a threat. Um, they will go, but if the therapist calls them out on anything, they'll never go again. Um, if they can con and charm the therapist and point the fingers at you with their charming male or female kind of, you know, wiles, then they are going to be you know, convincing the court and everything else that you're the narcissist. So again, that projection of, of everything is just overwhelming. Well, I feel better. I, I've gone to therapy. I have no problems going to therapy. So woohoo for me, I'm not a narcissist. Yay. <laughs> you know, and I don't... they do it for, for pretending, but um, they'll, they'll go and say, look, I went to therapy. I tried I then blame the therapist for not being good when they left. So. Oh, right. I mean, that makes sense because like you were saying, they don't, they don't want to be there to begin with. So they might as well blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right. So if they can blame you with a therapist, then that's a good thing, right? She's the crazy one. And they'll point the finger back at you. But if they can't blame you and the therapist is calling them out on their stuff, then they blame the therapist and never go back. 
You know, you were talking earlier, Tracy, about, you know, communication during the divorce with a narcissist. What tips, again, advice can you offer for after the divorce? Because especially if you have kids, you're still going to need to deal with that, that person, you know, your significant, significant other. So how do you, how do you still deal with that? Um, I know I, for me, even after my divorce, I still felt, you know, like shit, we're we're just going to use the word shit. That's going to be our word for the day anyway. Um, (laughs) Because I felt like I was a crappy dad. I felt like I was a crappy husband. I felt like I was a crappy man. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what can you offer to after the divorce as far as, you know, dealing with that, that person? Mm-hmm. Um, really good question. So the key to a successful co-parenting with a narcissist is to have actually um, put a lot of stipulations. I call it the gray areas of divorce decree, like spelling out the rules so that they can't break them. Right. Um, and so if you can build that in, you'll have a more successful co-parenting relationship. If things get like normalized, you get them Christmas this year, I get them Christmas next year. Okay. We're good. That's the normal divorce decree. But the reality is, a narcissist will take the kids on Christmas Eve and not bring them back for two weeks because it doesn't say when. So they they ride that line. So the more you can get in, the better your post like divorce stuff is going to be limited. You are going to have to come up with ways to communicate with them that if they are on that like bad spectrum, ordering a parenting app like Family Wizard or you know the other family one. Um, having those be the, the method of communications with strict rules. Like you can't text me at 10 30 at night, or if it's on a parenting app, you have specific things. I will answer it. If it's not an emergency within 24 hours, when you can put those kind of stipulations into the decree, post-parenting will be easier, right? Because now there's specific rules. If you don't define them, they will break them. So, um, Then the next part is really learning about communication and how to deal with their meltdowns, if you would, their um, rejection, their turning the kids against you, just how to deal with the day-to-day is going to have to be, there's a book out there and I I highly recommend it to anyone who's co-parenting with a narcissist on how to communicate. I have two that I'll mention. One is called Biff, B-I-F-F. It is written by Bill Eddy, who is the founder of the High Conflict Institute. There's a red one for regular people and a a green one for co-parenting. It is how to have those difficult conversations when they are constantly yelling at you, accusing you. You need to have those skills. The other one is called Magic Words by Lindsay Ellison. Love this book. It's 70 tiny little pages, but the, the concept behind it it's, it's actually on the cover, how to get what you want from a narcissist, because we are having to nurture their ego by telling them things in our conversations to get something. And in the book, for example, like mom wants dad to pay $600 for the kid to go to drama class. And the dad's like, nope, my son is a football player. He's not going to go to drama. Not my son, right? And the, the wife knows that getting $600 is going to be really hard. So when you use the magic phrases, and she's got a whole bunch of them built into it, but you're soothing their ego based on what their fear is. Their fear is not being seen, not being heard, not being thought of as the best. Um, and so if you can come at that same, I want to, you know, you to pay for for drama, you could come at them and go, you know, you're so good at this. Everyone's going to know what a great dad you are for letting him try something that he thinks he's passionate about might not be his life thing, but you're so good at supporting him. I know everyone's going to think that, right? You want to barf in your mouth, but now their ego is soothed. It's not, you're asking for $600, you (laughs) B-I-T-C, right? It's not that now you've sued their ego, right? By saying you're so good at, right? Um, I hear you is another really good thing. And it's not like I hear you, but again, they're worried about being seen and heard. So going, I hear you. That's an interesting concept. 
but let me think about it. You're not saying no, you're giving it air and time to not be in a battle in that moment, right? So again, coping strategies like that, and this these are two small, tiny little examples. There's a lot more to it, but also learning how to not let them trigger you, right? Because they know exactly how to push your buttons, which creates a more hostile, you know, you're always combative. If they're triggering you, you're coming at it with that, how dare you? So you have to learn how to not let these things by almost expecting them. Of course, they're going to do that. Of course, they're going to challenge me, not show up and then blame me, right? If you have that and you can manage your triggers and not be reactive, which is what they want. Supply to them could be that they are getting to control your emotions. So that is, again, another tactic to to better define the communication because that's what you've got to do. You've kind of have to like soothe their ego in order to to make them not be on the defense and attack. That's that's so spot on just because I, again, reliving some of the things uh, in my past with my my uh, former spouse and you talk about triggers well my trigger was after i would drop our son off at our neutral location i would get up the road and i would hear my phone go off and that would trigger oh my gosh what did i do wrong now mm-hmm. and, and it's you know it, it could have been an email from somebody else but it didn't matter I was so, you know, uh, Pavlov's dog, you know, I would hear the email tone go off on my phone because I was so accustomed to that of dropping our our son off. And again, getting an email saying you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. Mm -hmm. And then one of the things that I, I really wish I knew more about, you know, after my divorce and I'm a big big supporter of, of stoic philosophy where, you know, just talking about, you know, essentially letting things go, uh, don't putting, uh, you know, the, the story in your head when in reality it doesn't happen that way. And so, you know, going back to what you were talking about too, Tracy, having that open co- uh, communication, having that open dialogue and figuring out, all right, what is that trigger? Why, why are you feeling this way? And, getting uh getting your your mind to a point where why is this triggering me what what's the big deal and then you know the thing you you talked earlier too about is you know getting therapy going you know to a therapist and or or in your situation a coaching somebody who's been in that situation mm-hmm Exactly. And, and for, for me on the triggers, you made the e- excellent point because our phone becomes an enemy. Every time it rings, you're like, oh, oh, what did I do wrong? Or, oh gosh, the kids didn't have their soccer sneakers. I'm going to be in trouble, right? Whatever it is that might not even be as important as their soccer sneakers, but you know, you didn't help them with their homework or they got two answers wrong, whatever it is, that sort of thing. You're like instantly triggered and to me, understanding what's behind the trigger is the way to put the trigger to sleep. Uh, because let's say it's, it's you know, you, you get the text and you did something wrong. And now you're like, okay, I did something bad or I'm just going to yell and I know I didn't do it bad, but it's coming. Um, it's I, And then you're like, well, what are you feeling? I might be feeling angry right now because I didn't do that. I might be feeling defensive right now. There's so many things that we could be feeling with a trigger. We can feel shame, guilt, like, oh God, shamed. I did something wrong, right? There's so many different trigger kind of things like that. But looking be below that to the why of the trigger, it's not just because they did that, but I have this list of triggers in front of me. And uh, one of the things is the feeling underneath it is I feel like the bad guy. I feel unsafe. I feel unloved, unheard, powerless, judged, blamed, disrespected, couldn't speak up. Those are just a few examples in the example you gave us, right? It's not the anger that we have to worry about. It's the why. Why do you feel it? Because every single time someone makes you feel like the bad guy, you get triggered because of that person. And you have to, if you're going to go into another situation and marry someone else, you want to know that that's your trigger. So if someone makes you feel like the bad guy, this is how you react. I get angry, right? You have to know the pattern and what's behind it in order to heal it. 
In in your book, what were some stories? And and every time, <laughs> the more I thought about the title for your book, I I go back to. I heard an early interview with uh, Tim Ferriss when he was talking to his uh, publisher about uh, the four hour work week and the four hour work week, one of the working titles, and I'm going to have, it's not going to be correct, but it was along the lines of how to become a drug dealer. And his publicist said, no, no, you can't, you can't do that because part of it was he, he started a, a, a fitness health drug company um, and then it morphed into the four hour work week, but, uh, along these, you know, you can't make this shit up. What, what were some of the stories that you received for the book that you're just sitting there going, Oh, this can't be real, but it was. Mm -hmm. There's so many, again, thousands were submitted, but I talk to people all day long, right? I have support groups with 40 people in a room that are telling me the terrible stories, they, they end up being very much the same types of tactics, right? Um, but the stories that I hear from, you know, someone having 17 broken bones over their relationship on the high scale of crazy and, and, and actually dangerous, right? To the lies and the, the, the um, stealing of assets, um, the hiding of assets, the opening credit cards up in your name and running up a hundred thousand dollar bill that you don't even know are in your name. Um, you know, cutting opening credit lines or spending the entire home equity so that by the time you actually go through and you don't even know what's happening. And then you go through the divorce, you're like, oh, we have no equity in our house because he took out a, a thing and we don't even know where that money went, right? Those are the kind of things that using the children against you as a weapon is one of the most like hurtful things that I hear. And just the, the pain, you know, just not showing up at the bus stop when they're supposed to be there and then the kids sitting there crying, you go pick up the kid and they blame you for not telling them that it was their day when it's been their day for three years. Um, but now the kid is crying and you're patching the pieces together, whether it's in the divorce where they're using the children against you um, to, you know, make the, I have so many friends. I was in a domestic violence coalition group in Denver for a while with other victims. And I have several friends who they told such terrible lies to the children about her and then repeated them in court. He had been arrested four times for physically abusing her and was put in jail twice. And he got all four of their children because he alienated them from mom, told lies about her in the courtroom and had fake witnesses up there. Now that is how they use the children against people. And you're sitting there with your mouth on the floor going, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, well, yes, but in, in, in my space and, you know, the blended family and the divorce, it's and unfortunately, you know, going to use piggyback on that example of, you know, like family court. You know, I mean, family court is, in my opinion, and I've said this several, several times, it's a joke because they really don't look at both sides. And I firmly believe that there needs to be, and, you know, I'm not a smart person. I'm, I'm the dumbest person in the room. I don't know how to fix family court where we're not hearing those, those horrible stories that you were just talking about, Tracy, because and I, you know, as I'm sitting here getting choked up, because now I'm real, my trigger right now, Tracy, I'm reliving when I was in court, I'm like, God, that day sucked. But anyway, moving on. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's wonderful that, you know, in your book, you get to share these stories to help so many people. But if you look at it this way, if these people didn't have these stories, Mm -hmm. How how sad or let me know how happy it would be where they didn't have these stories if you know people were nice. I don't know. I'm just 
I'm rambling and, and now. That's the difference between a nice person and someone who has no conscience to do these type of things. Um, having someone committed, for example, having your spouse committed. Heard a story just last week that they were away on vacation and he called the police. They took her away and committed her and he left the state and went home with their three children, left her there, right? Wow. And again, commitment is like probably once a week I hear about that, um, you know, planting evidence, putting cocaine in your car and calling the police on you. And like, what? I, I don't even know what that is. And they don't care that they're sending you to jail for that. But now you don't get the kids. And, um, you know, that's that was their game. That's what they wanted. So, you know, we're talking about the extreme cases. But in a narcissistic divorce, you can expect everything. You can expect the, the stonewalling of never handing in paper. During my divorce, we had seven trials. We were not fighting over house. It was sold and the money was in escrow in a lawyer's office. We didn't have a kid we were fighting over. Seven trials. I didn't kill anybody, but stonewalling, he never gave any of his papers. And then in the end, blamed it on me that I wouldn't give them to him. He'd already gotten 5,000, like of all of our statements for me. I wasn't blocking the bank, walk in, you know, but here it is. She's, bl she's blocking me. She won't let me have the taxes. And I'm like, wait, we have like three or four, you know, subpoenas in because you won't give me the taxes because it's your attorney. But like, he could have taken those 5,000 pieces of paper and copied them and handed them in because it's our same statements, right? But stonewalling month after month after month after month and running my legal bill for a $2,500, $25, $25,000 settlement, it cost me $100,000. Oh my gosh because of this false allegations and one after another you did this you you forged our prenup like we had to go and get the 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 lawyer who did the prenup 15 years before to come into court for the second battle because he's accusing me of forging it like i didn't forge it <laughs> but another battle another hurdle that that's the kind of thing and then in 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 my divorce decree it says on a line that the judge could not figure out why the, the fees were so high. Well, he had four lawyers, so that could be on his side why, right? But in my case, we're saying it got so expensive because we kept having to fight him. He wouldn't hand in any papers. He would do this, he would do that. But in the end, the judge said, and I can read it right off my thing right now, that he couldn't figure out why it got so expensive, but he was in contempt of court for six of the seven trials. And so we're going, the reason is because he's in contempt. He's not giving us anything. And they said the reason that we were in, that, that it got so expensive was that it was a witch hunt that we were demanding all of the normal disclosure papers. So he actually used the word witch hunt in, this is the judge putting it in that they said it was a witch hunt. And this was, you know, 11 years ago. So pre the, the word being very popular, but again, it's why go that far? It's a simple split. You take half the money. I take half the money. Have a nice day. Why go through all of those levels of accusing me of forging my son's college loan? Well, I had all the papers that he knew it and, and, and he signed it, but they sat there and we went through entire trials over that one fact. And the reality was I already had the files. So he ended up taking the college loan, but it didn't stop him from fighting me for a year for that. Um, I want to respect your time, Tracy. Do you, do you still have some more time? Sure, sure. So uh, along those lines, after going through that hell and back, after shelling out hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it not just the, the financial piece, but the mental piece, mm -hmm. what, what got you through it all? Um, and I know it's 11 years ago, but what, what, what did get you through it all? Well, again, I had no idea what I was dealing with. So I got through it with a therapist who, when I did find out after that guy had me arrested and found out, I'm like, oh my God, therapist, what does this mean? I learned this word. And he said, they like to look in the mirror. So going to a therapist for four years during the process, this man didn't even know what 
we were dealing with, right? But I continued. I kept on going to different therapists and, and looking for more. My friends got me through it, but the fear basically ruled my life for so many years because I had lost everything. Like I, I not only lost my half of the house, but I've lost my retirement account, which had to be depleted to pay the lawyers. You know, I lost my life insurance, the equity in it, had to use it. So it, it was it was this wound of how will I start again? And for me, it didn't mean I was changing careers. I only officially changed careers, um, you know, took down my other career sign about a year ago. I was doing two jobs at once. And at that time, putting together and writing this book. So it was the need to survive that kept me through it. I wasn't going to go down. And yes, the finances were taken from me and I had to reinvent myself, but I got through it. And there is life after this. When you start to read about narcissists and you get through, say, a divorce, it's important to not keep watching YouTube videos on narcissists. You do not need to hear another video on um, how they ruin holidays, right? How they're so selfish. They ruin your birthday for you. You don't need to hear that again. You need to learn how to heal the wounds. And that's where so many people, if, I, if they come into my support group and they have been healed and I saw them two years ago and pre-COVID and you're still coming here and you're still saying you're watching a YouTube video of about narcissists every day, you're not healing. You're living in yesterday, right? Mm. We have to look at tomorrow and go, okay, maybe I need to learn better boundaries or maybe I'm a codependent. Maybe I need to learn self-love. Like I didn't think I didn't have self-love until I learned that I wasn't standing up for myself. Someone with strong boundaries would have said no way to half the stuff I put up with. So learning my own liability and almost vulnerability. And then for almost, I, I'm not saying a number here, but I'd say 70% if I'm going to make up a number, right? 70% of victims of this kind of abuse in a relationship as we're talking here have a tie to their family that made this normalized. I didn't know it. Once I learned about the, the narcissist, then I went, oh God, that's my boyfriend. That was my ex-husband. That was my in-laws. I went further. Oh my God, that was my mother. That was my sister's. And no wonder ghosting, I have it in the line in the book. Ghosting was our family vacation. It was normal for someone to not talk to me because that's what my family did all my life, right? I didn't have boundaries because if you have a narcissistic parent, you're not allowed to set a boundary, you know, and, and they weren't supportive. So I got used to that. So again, that's the kind of wounds, like where's my accountability? And I'm not victim blaming. Nobody is responsible for this but there are things that made us more vulnerable. And then there's things that wounded us from this, like trusting ever again. How do I trust again? You know, those sort of things are the wounds that we need to fix afterwards. Yeah. Uh, the trust thing um, that is, that is so key. And I think um, in, in my marriage, my, my wife and I, I think the biggest thing that really helped us um, was you know, both of us came from very similar uh, past marriages. And for us, it was building that trust that, you know, neither one of us was going to become the spouse that we just came from. Mm -hmm. And when my wife came to me and said, hey, would you be, in, be okay going to, you know, couples counseling, marriage counseling before, you know, we, we, not only move in together, but get married. I said, oh, yeah, I'm all for it because I, I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm very transparent. I, I, I'll, you know, I'll talk to a wall and let the wall know, Hey, by the way, wall, I'm, I'm feeling a little anxious today. Can you help me? But I have no problems going to a therapist and, you know, knowing that the reason why I'm there is to build a foundation uh, for my wife and I and, and build a, a good marriage. And from there, we built a, I think, a, a pretty good uh, blended family. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's the difference. The narcissist would have never gone. They would have suggested it or gone. And I, this might sound like a dumb question, but can, in your opinion, can it be healthy 
to have some narcissistic tendencies in ourselves. And, and when I think of along the lines of, you know, building confidence, or are you still an asshole if, if you're a narcissist? Um, so rephrase the question again, because I had an answer and then that last line threw me off. So rephrase it again. <laughs> so can, can you have healthy narcissistic tendencies? Absolutely. Again, we go back to that selfie. We go back to self-love. We go back to someone who has strong boundaries and, you know, they can be perceived as the bitch because they have strong boundaries, but that is healthy self-love. That is saying no to things that might hurt you. And, and that's the difference between a narcissist. It's not about boundaries or self-love. It is about hurting others. Okay. And they are wounded. Like all narcissists are, you know, the, the, the medical you know, manuals are telling us that people become narcissistic, A, either by having a narcissistic parent. So they learn that's their behavior. That's what you do. Um, or they were abused as a child and they use this as a coping structure to not let people hurt them. So they are very wounded, but for us, you know, a, a normal amount of, of, it's not, it's, it's, it's self-love versus narcissistic tendencies, right? Again, if you look at the narcissistic tendencies of being selfish and lying and using masks to, to hook people and lie, um, those aren't on the self-love spectrum that we're talking about. You know, again, feeling good about yourself, feeling confident um, is what we hope to you know, teach our children to do. That's not a bad thing. It's when you become more important and you hurt others in the, in the, in the direction. I, I know you're, you're not a doctor, Tracy, but in your experience, can, um, can, can there be a little bit of a, a chemical imbalance that possibly caused becoming a narcissist? And what I mean by that is, or for example, I know somebody that was, um, I don't want to say normal, but they were normal. They were fun. They were, you know, um, just somebody you enjoy to hang out with. And they uh, ended up being pregnant and had, had a child. And after that, their, their whole personality changed. Mm. So again, what we're talking about there in that situation is they've hidden their, their self-entitlement, right? Often, like, let's say in this particular scenario, the wife just had the baby, the husband's the narcissist, right? In this particular situation, the narcissist ends up maybe flipping like all before that you gave them plenty of love. They were number one. They were center of attention along comes baby and uh, the uh, flips because now they're not number one. Now they're doing for someone else and they're accountable and they just want people to do things for them. So in that, again, we're reversing the male and the female here, but in that situation, there's what we call a narcissistic injury where they're not number one. How dare you take care of that baby before you take care of my needs? That's what happens. And again, different perhaps with your friend, but it's their loss of control because now they've got to be responsible for someone else. And that's very hard for them. So then the mask of normalcy drops and they can't even pretend to be it anymore. Oh my gosh. That makes so much sense, Tracy. Yeah. So much sense. The, uh, uh, the, the minions movie light bulb just went off on my head <laughs> that it, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Wow. Can I explain masks for another second? Because that we're yeah. on. It. So, so a narcissistic mask is this persona that they custom build for the victims that they are trying to like, let's say like, and again, narcissists can be in the workplace and, you know, your next door neighbors and all kinds of other things, but let's use relationships here. So they build a mask when they first meet you 
it's almost like an interview. Yes, we're having coffee or we're having a drink, but they are actually like looking at your weaknesses. Like how, what kind of family do you have? Do you have a strong family? Do you get to see them a lot? That seems like a normal first date question. But what they're doing under the table is, yay, they don't have a support system. They'll make a good supply. And so that's the first part of it, right? They try to test your boundaries. Do they speak up when I don't do what I said I would do? Another test. But as they're sitting there building and talking to you and deciding, okay, once they've checked a couple things like those things, you'll make a good supply. The next part of it is, wow, Tracy loves three-legged dogs with one blue eye. Guess what? So does he, right? <laughs> You like skiing? They like skiing. You like, you know, your tea this specific way? Oh my God, we couldn't be more perfect. No one ever liked the same books I like, right? They build this persona on what they're asking you, you like. You want to run away to an island? Well, so do they. That's always been their dream. So they're pretending and building this false persona of who they are just to hook you. Then somewhere in the relationship, and again, it can be quickly. I've had people on my screen that on their honeymoon, first night, got punched in the face and they had never even had a fight before. And the guy said, sorry, you do what I say from this point forward. Like it just can be a flip like that. Now he has control. They're on their honeymoon. He has the control. He doesn't need to put up the mask anymore. It's got her hooked and she was financially more secure. And, and that's what he wanted in the supply, but now he's controlling her. So the mask can fall and, and they don't care about that like public persona, but they have different masks. So as we're talking about this relationship, they can also have the, I'm the best soccer dad um, mask. And everybody thinks they're so great where they could be, you know, the, the person in the church that has a position and they're so spiritual that everyone thinks they're wonderful, but they go home and beat their wife. So it's this mask to the public, they're one thing. And as soon as the door closes, there's something else. My ex-husband was so charming he actually called himself prince charming and um <laughs> and his family called him that and then they were like but you're the princess you know it was like gagulating now but at the time it was like <laughs> oh i'm marrying prince charming how nice i mean people called him that and so i just thought that was the charm that was the charm it was so wonderful but as soon as the door would close those passive aggressive, you're not good enough. Or, you know, you loaded the dishwasher wrong. The knives go in this section, you know, and it's like little tiny pick, pick, pick. That's the devalue stage. And all you're like, oh, I did it wrong. I'll try harder. I'll try harder. And then they get them to be better servants in this example, because they've told them they aren't doing it right. So a codependent, people-pleasing, boundaryless person like myself is going to try harder to make them happy because, God, I want to get back to that wonderful time when you idolized me. That's the mask part. Make sense? Yeah. Um, gag gagulating? Is that a real word? I think I made it up. That's an awesome... You, you There's <laughs> another trademark for you, Tracy. <laughs> I'm like, that's a great word if it's real or not. I love yeah. it. Gagulating. Uh, before I give you the last question, mm -hmm. so once again, the new book, Divorcing Your Narcissist, You Can't Make This Shit Up. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you have a plethora of different social media, but how can people get a hold of you, Tracy? And also, uh, uh, oh, before, before you say that, uh, one of your book endorsements mm -hmm. is uh, somebody uh, I, I, I cherish, and that's uh, Susan Guthrie. She is awesome. Uh, and I saw I saw that in in the notes. I'm like, ah, oh, Susan, she rocks. Anyway, how can people get a hold of you? How can people get a hold of your new book? Sure. Um, before we go into that, I will tell you that remember I told you about that lawyer that had to be called in for my prenup that she had written, you know, years and years before, right? And challenging me in the divorce. That was Susan Guthrie. She was my no first way. Attorney. <laughs> yeah. But she was also my sister's friend growing up. And so that's how she became my, diver my divorce attorney for that first one. And then, you know, now we're friends and I just did a video with her. Um, she is awesome. So yes. how people can reach me, I have a website. It is called NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. 
not narcissistic. Someone had that URL. Um, so it's narcissist abuse support from there. You can re, you know, reach out, find my YouTube channel. Um, you can find the book on there. I have like a, a, I have two journals. I've just invented 26. Um, I call them targeted healing journals. I have a toxic parenting tracking journal. I have a tracking your divorce journal, like just like the notes from the mediator, the notes from the therapist, the notes about what you got to do, the notes about what they said, the things they did to your child, you keep it all in one place, right? So all of that is going to be on the website because I just want them to know that if they are questioning whether or not they're with a narcissist, go to that website and download my red flag checklist. So many people look at it and go, I didn't know it until I checked all the boxes, Tracy. Oh, that'll help. So, so those are, are those physical journals? Yeah, they're, they're available on Amazon. So you can find them on my website and it clicks over and you buy them from Amazon. That I have one coming wonderful. today, which is the most, I can't wait. It's my sample that's coming today, but I've been writing it for about a month. And again, in this journal, it has this particular one. It has nine pages of instructions on what you should journal. This one that's coming today is... Um, you know, processing your decision to go no contact with someone. So if you have a narcissistic mother and you don't want to talk to her anymore, like, again, I get these clients on my screen. What do I do? I don't know. And, it, and I'm like, well, we have to think about it. What would it look like? How do you tell your children? They don't have grandma anymore. So, you know, there's so many situations. So that I have those kind of things. I have a processing your triggers. What are you feeling? Where do you feel it in your body? What's the why, as I described before? Again, nine pages of instructions. Every time you're triggered, pick it up, follow the nine steps and write it all down. And then all of a sudden you'll have this ninja power that like when you get triggered in the middle of the store and go, oh my God, I just thought of something or they did something. You can process that trigger in five minutes in your head and let it go so it doesn't ruin your day. So you have to build that skill to learn how to figure out what the trigger was and process it. So they're all on Amazon. Well, I guess I need to head over to targetedhealingjournals.com to get my trigger journal. Absolutely. It's yeah. a really amazing, amazing tool. And so I'm just kind of putting the things that I coach my clients with and, and my groups um, I'm just putting like, wow, we talk about letting go. And, and when I have a, a session on letting go to people, I'm like, all right, we're going to talk about letting go. And like, oh yeah, I got to do that. I'm like, well, what are you holding on to? Well, I don't know. Okay. Well, let's look at that. Um, we can't let go of something if we don't like understand what it is and why we want to let go of it. And then we, you know, have the, the instructions on how to learn to let something go. Do you, uh, do you want to tell that, that little parable? about letting things go. Letting go, oh, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. We because we did this the other day. So, um so the, the one about the monks are we talking about? Yeah, one? yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. So, this is one of the things that I, I tell my people and it's in context to whatever they're trying to learn to let go of. Um there's these two monks that are on their way back to the monastery after the rain and um they reach a river and there's a woman there help me help me i can't get across so the old monk picks her up puts her over his shoulder walks her across the river puts her down and they kept on walking six hours later they get to the monastery and they reach it and the young monk starts to scream at the old monk how could you touch a woman you know we're not allowed to do that how could you do that how could you do that and the old monk puts his hands together in prayer and says i put her down six hours ago you're the one holding on to her. So I tell people that story and go, what are you holding on to right now? We don't have to hold it on. We can put it by the river and acknowledge that we felt it, but not carry it. If it's anger, not carry it into tomorrow. If it's fear, let go of the fear and have a plan. If this happens then, right? So we can put things down if we know what we're holding on to. I love that. I love that parable. All right, Tracy Malone. Last question. Here we go. Tracy, what are you looking forward to for tomorrow? What are you looking forward to tomorrow? Oh, I have so many ideas. Um, I just, I just keep building these journals. They, they are bringing so much passion to me. Uh, I'm building more courses. Actually, what I'm building now is a, I'm calling it building a narc-proof parenting plan. 
and it's going to be a whole course. I have a hundred thousand words written and I've got to start recording 28 videos, but um, worksheets basically don't let those gray areas go unnoticed. And it's not just for narcissistic divorces. It's any divorce. Cover your butt, get more specific than the, you get them Christmas this year. I get them next year. Christmas starts at 9 a.m. and you'll have them back by nine the next day or whatever you define, right? I have that parenting plan in my future. That's, I got to get those recorded. So those are the things I just, so busy writing another book on um, narcissistic parents and sort of the discoveries that I made after they were dead um, was really when that all came to, oh my God, look what I was with. No wonder I was really good narc bait. So those are my future. Wow. Uh, Tracy, thank you so much for your time. I am, uh, I, I, I love the fact that we were able to take, you know, uh, a post on LinkedIn, turn that around to you reaching out to me and, and me being on your podcast, you coming on my podcast. I'm so grateful for, for you, Tracy. I still think you should change your last name. Uh, <laughs> Tracy's new book, Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. Tracy, you rock. Thank you so much for having me. I am so grateful to have you in my life. Let's keep in touch.